Hello, welcome to the Q&A for Adventures for Healing in the Dreamtime. Explore 12 world traditions to access sanctuaries, spiritual allies, and keys to transformation. I'm Anne Patricia with the Shift Network, and I am so honored to be your host as we explore the teachings of Robert Moss and address questions for his course, Adventure, Adventures for Healing in the Dreamtime, which begins on Thursday, June the 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Now, if you're unable to join us live, you can still participate in this course, and I'll explain more about all of that that later. But first, I want to introduce my guest. Robert Moss is a beloved faculty here at the Shift Network. He's the creator of Active Dreaming, an original synthesis of modern dream work and shamanism. Born in Australia, he survived three near-death experiences as a child, which provided him with early access to other realms. He is a brilliant resource, a best-selling novelist, poet, journalist, and an independent scholar, and I am so grateful to have him here with me today. And now I invite you to join me in welcoming Robert to our session, who is going to lead us in an opening practice. Hi, Robert. Welcome to, this, welcome to the call. Good to be dreaming with you, Anne, and all you dreamers <laughs> out there. Yes, we're talking about maybe having a simple practice by way of opening our themes today. I know that we have dreamers at every level of practice from people who haven't been remembering their dreams for a long time and maybe have never learned how to fully value dreams or share them with other people to people who are absolutely ready to go deep into the night school of Anubis in ancient Egypt, which is where we're going in one of these classes and to go deep into dreaming with the goddess and the bull in ancient Mesopotamia, and to go deep with the interdimensional teacher Seth in his understanding that the dream universe is the source of what happens in the physical universe. We're on a path of radical adventure, drawing from 12 different world traditions and approaches. Mr. Jung will be in this, of course, how not? The secrets of ancient shamans will be in this. But maybe we should create a clear and simple space to begin our journey together and to give a taste of the banquet of offerings that is awaiting you with this course. So I want to offer you a very simple meditation, which I call Journey to the Cinema of Lost Dreams. There's different variations on this. What is the cinema of lost dreams? Well, it's a place where you can find one of those dreams that might have gone missing. However active and prolific a dream recaller and recorder you may be, you're still missing dreams, right? I miss dreams every night, even when I write down half a dozen. I know there are others that are gone. What's been going on? What was I doing? What was I given beyond the dreams I remember? And maybe it's something beyond that. Maybe it's about right now in these dark, difficult, crazy times. Finding a dream, which is a vision of possibility, maybe an image of healing, maybe an encounter with a sacred guide, because that goes on in dreams. And that's very much part of the new course, our access to the sacred guide and healer in the sacred night. Maybe that's waiting. So I'd like you to get your body in a comfortable, relaxed position. And I'm going to say some words of protection and blessing for you, which you can use in your life if you like them. I'm going to say the invocation of the gatekeeper. We always start my classes with this. I start every day with this. It's a very simple way of invoking guidance, blessing and protection for our life journey. And we need something like that, don't we, right now? When I speak of the gatekeeper, the gatekeeper has many names, many forms. Ganesha, beloved form in India, Hecate or Hermes for the Greeks, Anubis and so on. But this is universal. I'm not signing up for an ancient religion. That might be a good idea. I'm not doing it right now. So as we prepare to make a journey together, a simple journey, but nonetheless a journey in consciousness that can go very deep, may our doors and gates and paths be open, and our doors and gates and paths between the worlds, and may the doors and gates and paths of any who wish to do us or those we love any harm be closed. May it be so. So I'd like you to get your body in a comfortable, relaxed position. I'd like you to follow the flow of your breath for a moment or two. And as you breathe out, I'd like you to release anything that's holding you back right now, anything that's preventing you from being present to a moment of imagination and adventure, a very simple taste of conscious dreaming, wide awake, lucid dreaming. And as you breathe in, you're breathing in a sense of possibility. Now I'm going to ask you to pull up a scene from your memory, your memory of ordinary life, or maybe your memory of a dream adventure. 
I'm going to ask you to pull up the memory of a place like a cinema or a theater, an opera hall, if you like, a place where you've been to watch a movie, to watch a play, to enjoy an opera or a concert and being excited. I'd like you to find a place like that from your life memories. Maybe it's a place that exists in the world of imagination, in the dream time. Probably it's a place that you know fairly well in regular life. You might be going back to childhood and remembering that place you went for the Saturday matinee, that cinema, right? Or it might be that modern multiplex kind of deal with all the glass and all those escalators. Or it might be beautiful music hall where you were in a European city in the days before the pandemic. I'm thinking of a place like that right now. So I want you to hold that image on your mental screen. I want you to picture yourself doing this. You're approaching the entrance to your cinema, your theater, your concert hall, and you see the marquee maybe, you see posters, you see announcements, and then maybe some of these are familiar titles of plays or movies or musical compositions, but among them are phrases that belong to you. They are there for you. They're the titles of things from your dreams and things from your life. You might even see a big marquee sign saying your life dream or your dream life. You're coming to this space to get a glimpse of a dream that you need right now. Maybe one of those that went missing, maybe a fresh one that's being produced for you by your dream producers right now. So picture this, you're going into the lobby, into the entrance, through the entrance, into the, into the dream theater or dream cinema. And there of course is a ticket counter. And there's someone at the ticket booth. Can you see that? Can you feel that? And you're going to have to make some kind of payment in order to get in and your payment is to announce an intention. I'm here for a dream that I need for my life. That's your intention. And probably the person at the ticket counter who might take a very interesting form for you it's going to ask you to put something down. You might be astonished. Didn't think you're carrying anything, but actually that backpack, that book bag, that suitcase, that steamer trunk, you've got some luggage probably, luggage of old habits, of limited understanding, things that get in your way, family histories, there's something you need to put down. And now you're shown into the screening room or the auditorium and a comfortable seat. Maybe you picked up a snack on the way, you can have some popcorn if you like, or a glass of champagne if it's a European concert hall. And you just take your seat and it seems as if the whole space is just for you. And you're looking and possibly there's a curtain on the stage in front of the screen, in front of whatever goes on behind the curtain. And you're relaxing in your seat and the curtain begins to open and a performance, a production begins to appear. And for now, it might just be a very quick glimpse, an animal, a fairy, an enchanted forest, a beach, a house from childhood, a departed loved one, someone who's reaching to you. And you feel as you watch the scene just beginning to become clear that you could, if you chose, step onto the stage or step through the screen and become part of the production, become part of the play. As the thing begins to evolve, here you are on this beach. Here you are swimming with the dolphins. Here you are relaxing on the warm sand, enjoying the rhythm of the waves. Here you are smelling the sunlight on a lover's hair. Here you are listening to the mermaid sing. You could let this unfold. You could find yourself in inside a personal cinema, a personal production, which might be simply relaxation and beauty, an enjoyment for you, an entertainment, or it might be an important encounter with someone who's been seeking you in dreams, but you have not been listening. So that's how it might begin. Now in a class, we would have now have some drumming or some water sounds or something to take you deeper. But for our purposes in this Q&A, it is a Q&A after all, I just want to give you the flavor of how an adventure like this might begin and how do you continue with it? Well, one of the ways you could continue this is in that liminal, in between space, between sleep and awake. You know, you're not awake, you're not asleep, you're somewhere in between. The place between sleep and awake is what Tinkerbell called it when she told Peter Pan in the old Disney movie, look for me in the place between sleep and awake. There I will always love you, there I will wait for you 
place where you remember dreaming, place between sleep and awake. One of the classes in the new course is called Dream Yoga with Tinkerbell. We're going to learn to do a lot more in an easy way in this liminal, fertile space. So that's where you could go when you're lying in the middle of the night or you haven't fallen asleep or you're drifting in the morning after coming out of sleep. You could put yourself in your version of the dream cinema, the cinema of lost dreams, and you could let a dream come to you or come back to you. And that could be the start for a wonderful adventure in lucid dreaming. So that's just a little flavor of the kind of thing we get up to. I want to answer one question that I know Anne has prepared to ask, but I want to answer it now. Someone asked in the questions that you sent ahead of this uh, session, and we're going to take live questions in a moment, is there going to be a journey in each class? Absolutely. There's going to be a shamanic journey in every class. When I say you're going to be invited to a dream class in the school of Anubis, you're going to go. We'll have a drumming journey and you will be sent into a certain space known in the ancient Egyptian imagination. You will go there. If I say we're going to explore what your parallel selves are doing in a parallel life, you're going to make a journey and you are going to go there. We'll use drumming, shamanic drumming. We'll use ocean sounds. We'll use bubbling spring water for the more meditative sounds. We'll go to a dream temple, a temple of dream healing. And we'll, we'll journey deep. We'll have multi-part journeys. So all of these classes are highly experiential. Yes, you'll get some lecture content. I like to talk and I do a lot of research and you'll get the benefit of the scholarship that I put into this and the experiences of other travelers who followed these roads. But every class is going to be a deep experiential journey. Or right, I'm going to pull back now because I know Anne has a lot of questions and some reports already, and I know that others are coming through. Yes, I do. Thanks, Robert. So we're going to spend the rest of our time together exploring your questions for Robert as we prepare for his video course, Adventures for Healing in the Dreamtime, which begins on Thursday, June the 25th. So please visit our website, dreamtraditions.com. That's dreamtraditions.com to learn more about our 13-week video course. You'll also find a link to register there as well. Now we're going to get started. Um, I want to thank everyone that sent in so many wonderful questions ahead of time for Robert. But those of you that are live, you're welcome to type your question into the chat and I'll bring it forward. We're going to begin with a question from our webcast. Why did you choose these 12 traditions for this course, Robert? What is the significance of these 12 at this time? Well, I think each of these traditions or approaches has something to teach us which is relevant to our time, starting with the content of the very first class, which is about accessing the secrets of the ancient dream shaman. So let me focus on that for a moment. You know, uh, the ancient shaman, who is a dreamer first and foremost in the language of languages of indigenous North America, the primary word for shaman means one who dreams. The ancient dream shamans, the one who gave us the rock, the Paleolithic rock paintings, uh, were experts in a number of things, experts at dreaming, entering the dream space at will to do healing, to scout out the possible future. They understood that dreaming is about more than what happens during sleep. It's a way of finding a road for the soul to get through the difficulties of this world and to find its way beyond death and to find its way back into the body when it's been lost or confused. So when we try to access the secrets of the ancient dream shamans, we are seeking to access vitally practical, vitally relevant techniques and practices and resources for our lives in these times. It's about soul and survival. When I say it's about soul, I mean it's about claiming a connection, a conscious connection with the real purpose and meaning of your life and finding ways specifically to get through the difficulties, the thickets, the brambles along the way. We need that right now. So that's where we begin. And, and we then we go to a number of traditions, uh, some of them connected with different cultural traditions. For example, there's a class called Dreaming the Celtic Soul Back Home. It's a lot of interest in Celtic traditions. I'm Scottish and Irish by ancestry. It's a lot of Celt and a bit of Viking, I suppose. So that's very much about uh, bringing the soul back into the body. You know, though anyone of Irish heritage knows the idea of being away, that you went away, you went off with the fairies, you went somewhere else, maybe the world got too cold and too cruel and part of you went away and it needs to be brought back into the body. So there we're drawing upon the, the, the goodly speech, the poetic wisdom of the Celtic tradition, which values eloquence and poetry so highly in the gift of storytelling. 
to bring more of soul into the body. We're going to go into the Asclepian tradition of the ancient Greeks and Romans. We're going to go to a temple of dream healing and see whether we can have a close up personal encounter with the sacred guide and healer in the way that the ancients hoped for. We're going to dream with Seth, I mentioned, the interdimensional entity who's taught us so much about how re reality is shaped by what happens in the dream universe and how stepping into the dream time out of our ordinary confusion about what happens next, we begin to realize we're connected with life dramas, with personalities who exist in past, future and parallel time. And from a certain point of view, it's all going on right now. So again, rise to the understanding that we are part of a multidimensional story. We have kin, we have connection across time and space. And we all share a connection to the self on a higher level. When we can rise to claim more of that connection, we can have perspective and even a sense of divine comedy when it comes to our everyday uh, situations. So that's just a taste of, of, some of, the, of some of the classes. But they're classes in approaches and traditions that I have dreamed, with which I have dreamed deeply, that have been deeply appealing uh, to other travelers. There are many new classes in this course that I have never offered before. We've never done dream yoga with Tinkerbell. We've never done dreaming with Seth. We're going to go dreaming with Gabriel. Yes, Gabriel, the archangel, the archangel of dreams for both Jews, Christians and Muslims. So we're going to learn out what it means for us to be in contact with the angel of our lives. We had some questions about that and those that came in early. We're going to explore what is the angel to us? What is Gabriel? What is the tradition of the uh, angel of the Annunciation, the angel of dreams? So all of these things speak to us, speak to our current needs, but we're also going to have some wonderful adventures that will remind us that dreaming we can travel without leaving home. We can go to the other side of the world and go to a restaurant in Paris. We can see friends. It's hard to see an ordinary reality. And we can dream into other worlds and other times, have marvelous adventures, marvelous entertainment, and bring back joy and energy from having sometimes the most fabulous destination travel, most fabulous vacation time all over the multidimensional universe. Wonderful, Robert. We're going over to a question that Aaron sent in. I rarely dream. I want to dream more as I did years ago. Now older and more conscious, I sleep profoundly usually. How can I dream more or remember them? Well, Aaron, I just gave you a place you can go to. You can go to the cinema of lost dreams. You can do that tonight. You can do that in, in a relaxed moment in the afternoon. You can do it any time of day and night. All you need to do is put yourself in an easy chair or stretch out on the bed and imagine what I suggested. You can go to a place, the cinema of lost dreams, the theater of dreams, and let the dream that is looking for you find you because your dreams are looking for you, Aaron. They really are. Now, when it comes to, you know, collecting sleep dreams and bringing more of them back. Pay again particular attention to those moments during the night when you're not awake, you're not asleep, you may have to go to the bathroom. But don't just do that. Multitask. Tell yourself as you go to the bathroom, I bet I've got something. And then when you begin to recognize you have a little something, maybe just a sense of color, maybe a little bit of a song, maybe just a tiny little visual, write it down, start keeping a journal. You don't think you've got anything much, write it down. Be kind to your fragments. Most of us have fragments from the night and we don't give them enough attention. They're not big epic dreams. They're not Jungian dreams. We just got a little bit of something. Well, that can be the start of recollection of bringing more back. And there's something more, Erin. There's something more. If you feel you've lost your dreams in recent time, you can do this. You can think about the last dream you remember that had any potency for you. It might be a long time ago. It might be 30 years ago. Doesn't matter. See if you can put your mind back to the last dream you can remember from your life, which had some power for you, including scary stuff. See if you can bring that up and then see whether you can imagine yourself stepping back into that dream, either as the child or the younger self dreaming the dream or as an older self going back into that scene to be with the younger self and companion them and observe them and maybe even give them a little bit of, you know, cheerleader stuff. I found that very interesting because sometimes we lose our dreams because of bad habits. Sometimes we lose our dreams because we let the outside world crush them out of us with its reduction attitudes. Sometimes, and this is very common indigenous understanding, sometimes we lose our dreams because for one reason or another, the bright dreamer in us has left, has left the house. 
the bright dreamer in us has gone away. I mean, shamans call that soul loss. You've lost your dreams because the part of you that is the bright dreamer went away. What do you do about that? Well, one thing you can do is, as I say, you can go back to the last dream you remember. Give that some attention. Try to find yourself inside it. So these are some, you know, uh, suggestions which go beyond what you'll find in most of the literature about these things, but they actually work. And finally, remember the world around you is a waking dream. It's speaking to you in the language of symbols and synchronicity. Make it your game, if you can get out and about at all, to receive the first three unexpected things around you as dream symbols from the world. This works too. Thanks, Robert. So Anne is asking, I've dreamed ever since I can remember, but don't always remember, and how to connect them to their meanings. Is this course a good start for beginners? Yes, this, this course works for people on all levels. And Anne, something I have to say to you very fiercely, gently but fiercely, you're going to find yourself an excellent company. You can find yourself in the company of remarkably interesting creative spirits from all over the world map who are going to support you on your own life odyssey, cheer you on, give you suggestions. So it's not just about your interaction with me or the course content. It's about the astonishing community that we establish. This stuff is contagious. Let me tell you a quick story about this. I was giving a lecture many years ago at the University of North Carolina in Asheville, and a very dig distinguished professor, older guy, younger than I am now, comes up and he says, Robert, you're a great speaker. I could listen to you all week, but I don't know whether I can trust anything that you're saying. And I look at him, that's not very polite. And he says, you see, I've never remembered, remembered a dream in 65 years, so I don't know whether dream stuff is for real. So I said this to him, Anne. I said, this is contagious. You've been in a room, a room of 300 people that night. Our people are keenly interested in dreaming. You're going to go home tonight and dream up a storm. He walks out with his eyebrows crawling towards his hairline. And in the morning, he's at the door of the workshop, waving a check. He says, I've got money. You've got to let me in. I know it's fully booked. So we let him in. He tells us a multi-part dream, which starts with him riding in the back seat of a long black limo driven by a chauffeur named Spirit. It guides into mysterious crossing, and he's so excited. He knows the dream is about preparing himself for the journey beyond death. First dream he's remembered. We honored it. We acted it out. We play acted it. So Anne, that was the contagious effect, the benign, the, part, the happy contagious effect of enthusiasm for dreaming on a person who never remembered their dreams. I assure you, you're going to find it irresistible. You're going to be given all sorts of ways to work and play with your dreams. And you're going to find that waking, sleeping and in between, the dream gates are going to be open to you. Yes, I'll add to that, that really watching these courses with the inner, inner mix of the people that come to this work from new to experienced dreamers and to watch the magic that happens is quite amazing. So I'm going over to a question from Jude. How can I invite dreams and spirit allies to assist in physical healing? Well, it's a good thing to learn to ask nicely. We're going to learn in the class where we go to a temple of dream healing that there are different ways of asking for an encounter with the divine healer, the sacred healer. And it's good to say something better than, you know, I'd like to feel well, I'd like to be 50 pounds lighter, I'd like you to fix my ticket or something. I quote in my work and use in adaptation, some words that were spoken by a famous ancient Greek. His name was Ilias Aristides. He was one of the foremost orators of his day. He had the ear of the Roman emperor. And he talked very closely to the divine healer that he knew. He knew the divine healer as Asclepius, who is the figure, who is the personification of healing through dreams for both the Greeks and the Romans. And if he wanted some help with his healing, he would speak this way to the divine healer as he knew that figure. He would say, I ask for the health my body requires to serve the purposes of the soul. I ask for the help my body requires to serve the purposes of the soul. That's my version of the way that he asked. I like this very much. If we can presume to put ourselves in the mindset of the angel or the deity, behind the curtain of this world. A human who speaks that way is much more interesting than a human who just basically says, fix this, gimme, I need, I need some help. To ask it like that, to serve the purposes of the soul. I think that's lovely. I think that is heard. And let's notice that the specific place of the direct encounter with the healing and sometimes the enactment of the healing itself in the ancient tradition of dream incubation 
is once again in that space between sleep and awake. It's in the testimonies from the temples of Asclepius. The deity or some form of the healer, feminine often rather than masculine, animal or reptile rather than human sometimes, the dog, the snake, Hygeia, Hygeia, the consort from whom we get the word hygiene, the, the, the golden child appear in a state between sleep and awake and an encounter takes place and a drama unfolds and sometimes in the morning according to the testimonies physical healing is accomplished. So I think it begins with framing the right intention and asking it with the right generosity of spirit and making sure that soul is involved because the kind of healing we're talking about is not just about healing the body. It's about healing the soul and letting that expand and stream through the physical systems and do the work. Thanks, Robert. This is from Emma. I have had dreams throughout my life of an apocalyptic nature. I often have strange locations in these dreams that I've never seen. Oddly enough, I stumble into these physical places much later in the future. My first instance of this was as a child. What significance could finding these physical locations hold for me? Should I be doing something when I end up in these dreamed locations? Hmm. An interesting question. There's about 16 questions within the one question, aren't there? Well, first of all, we, we dream the future maybe all the time. We dream the future in terms of rehearsing for challenges and opportunities in our own lives. We see mass events. I mean, whenever every, something big happens and is in the news, good, bad or indifferent, and people start reporting their dreams and their premonitions, we notice that lots of people seem to have dreamed into that coming situation. You're talking about apocalypse or, or something catastrophic. Uh, but the first thing to say is seeing the future in dreams is not unusual. We all do it far more often than most of us recognize. And Western psychology up to the present day has been rather slow to accept just how widespread this is. Our ancestors knew better. They regarded dreaming the future as a survival tool, part of an intuitive radar we travel with. It will show you where the enemy lies in hiding. It will show you to get the food you need to support your people through winter. And for practical people on the edge of survival, our ability to scout out the future in dreams for ourselves or our communities was of the essence. It was vital important. So there's that. Uh, dream your place before you go there? Yes. Why not? How, it, again, it happens all the time. So you want to note these things, you want to learn from them. If there are bad things going on in the dream that are playing out in a certain situation you don't know yet, or, or whatever's going on, bad, good, or indifferent, maybe you want to understand that dreams set as research assignments. You at a place you don't yet know, maybe if you think that something important is unfolding or could unfold there, you want to do some research and discover where it is. I accept research assignments for my dreams almost every morning morning of my life. It might be to run down a phrase in a foreign language. It might be to find a location of a place that I don't know, but I've dreamed I was there and I take clues. And if it's about the future, which it sometimes is, I'll ask questions like, you know, what's the weather like? Is there any indication of how much time has elapsed? Doing something in the dream to change what seems to be an unpleasant, unfortunate, even apocalyptic scenario. I'm a great believer in doing the best we can inside the dream space itself to shape the story to change the story if it's an unhappy story or going back into the dream which is a core technique of active dreaming dream re-entry going back into the dream to see if you can dream it through to a better conclusion change the story change the script write it a different way sometimes that works and sometimes it feels when we attempt this that the dream has its own gravity that it is something that is so close to physical manifestation that you really can't change the story that will manifest physically but even so you could get out of its way or help other people get out of its way. You dream of you dream of a natural disaster, for example, and maybe you can't affect what is going to happen in terms of the behavior of the tectonic plates of the planet or the behavior of the dormant volcano, but you could avoid going to that place so you could help someone to skirt a possible disaster. So those are a few brief uh, comments on a question that raises, as I say, many fascinating and important themes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> of course. So if you're just joining us, we're here with Robert Moss learning about his course, Adventures for Healing in the Dreamtime, which begins on Thursday, June the 25th. Please log on to dreamtraditions.com to see all the details and you'll find a link to register as well. We'll get back to your questions. We have quite a few here. Uh, Tanaya is saying, my dreams have been so intense, lots of chaos. I wake up so exhausted and sometimes upset. I've tried asking my spirit guides to help with these intense dreams. 
dreams, but I'm still getting them. I'm feeling exhausted. Is there anything I can do? Well, I think lots of people will sympathize with this. It sounds as if the dreams are replicating, maybe dramatizing a little bit the situation in our world. And we know that we're going through dark times. Our dreams sometimes are dramatizing the dark times we're going through to prevent us from getting too, too prematurely optimistic about how things are going to play out. I mean, we're not through the first wave of the pandemic, for example. So sometimes dreams which are, you know, dramatizing episode issues related to the pandemic are reminding us, don't think it's safe to rush around, have the barbecue without a face mask just yet. Our dream producers, and sometimes you feel the dream producers are starting a staging a production for you will sometimes dramatize and hype special effects in order to get a message across. So that might be something that's going on. But if I'm being routinely exhausted and drained by dreams of locales and situations I don't want to be in, I'm going to give myself a different agenda. I'm going to plan some destination travel. I'm going to imagine that I'm in the best kind of travel agency looking at places I could go. I mean, I can start from the cinema of lost dreams, the dream cinema, if I like. I can say to myself, OK, I'm going to pull up tonight and I'm talking about now lying in bed or this afternoon for a nap. Let me pull up a really happy image. It might be a place where I was content and rested and delighted. I was on a white sand beach in Aruba in my life, my physical life in January. It's the last time I've traveled anywhere. Well, I had a quick trip to California, I suppose. So I'm on a white sand beach in Aruba and the wind, the, wind, the breeze is just so and the taste of the daiquiri is just so and the, and the light on the water is just so. I could pull up that scene in my mind and I could make it my intention to go there. I mean, go there, dream there. I mean, I could let it become a lucid dream. And it might for a while really be a construct of my memory, if you like, a fantasy that I'm encouraging. But then it's going to evolve further. Or it might be a place in another world, another realm altogether where I can go. I'm going to tell myself it's OK for me to ask and direct myself, actually, to go and have some entertainment, to go to a place of healing and regeneration. And if I know such places, and who does not remember, let me slow down, who does not remember some place in this world, and maybe a place in a realm of imagination or dream time, where you've had a really good time, where you felt rested and healed, and your energy has been up, and you've been happy, call up a memory like that. Use that as your portal, whether you're going to try to go there during sleep, whether you're going to try to go there in the kind of lucid dreaming that becomes easy if you can learn to drift between sleep and awake. I would not be inclined to accept that I'm doomed to go on having a series of dreams which replicate or hype, even hype, the adverse and troubling situation in the world around me. There are things I do need to know. My dreams will give me things I would rather not see because there's action orientation there for me or for someone else to avoid something even worse, to avoid a tragedy, to avoid an illness. So I don't want to screen out the dreams that contain advisories, which I might rather not see, but really need to integrate. I don't want to screen those out. But I do want to say to myself, it is my intention to dream, to travel for entertainment, regeneration, laughter and healing. See how that works. I love that, Robert, the intention setting. Thank you. Um, we have one from Sue. Could you speak about going to university in the dream time? I feel they are connected, my dreams, to my spiritual evolution, but have not been able to obtain a feeling of po progress in the dream time. Well, I love the question. So yes, we absolutely go to night school. And some of us get to go to schools of advanced studies in a dream university. Uh, some of us who've traveled a lot on these roads even have a name for a university city. Its name is anamnesis. It means a kind of remembering of soul and spirit and essential knowledge that comes when you rise on the planes of understanding. You know, in one of the classes, we're going to explore in detail, in depth, the whole imaginal realm, the realm of true imagination as was explored and recognized by the great mystic Sufi travelers of what in the West was called the Middle Ages. Uh, and we're going to discover that there are literally schools of advanced learning available to us in these realms of dream time or imagination. It's not very easy to draw a dividing line between dream time and imagination. And there are wise teachers there and they're available. And uh, so I'm always happy when I hear any dream or experience any dream which has a classroom, lecture hall, 
school, university kind of setting. Because even if I don't like the content of the dream, it says to me, I am in school, I'm in life school, and maybe I'm in a school of consciousness on a higher plane. Who can I learn from? Can I tour, can I go back inside the dream? See, this is a very important technique which we'll learn in practice in this course, as in all my courses. Dream re-entry, you have a personal image, you've been to a certain place in your dreams, you can go there again. Hey. You went to that school, that beach, that park in ordinary reality, that house, you've been there, you could go there again. The same rule applies to our dreams. Location, location, location. You've been to a university, you've been to a restaurant, you've been to a temple in your dreams, you can go there again. And when you do that, if it's the university theme, well, why not look for the teachers you need to lead more, learn more from? Why not see what kinds of departments and faculties of learning are operating in your dream university? You might be amazed when you find there's a department of astral physics or a department of reality creation or a department of literary production, which I once discovered, which is a writer I was delighted to be in touch with. And there was C.S. Lewis and other people wandering around in the, the common room in the department of literary production. So naturally, I had a conversation. So, you know, if you've got any elements of remembering from a scene like a dream university, for goodness sake, don't be content with what you have so far, whether it's good, bad or mixed, accept this as an invitation to go back into that environment, meet more of the faculty, see more of what is in offer and bring back more gifts. Thanks so much, Robert. We did have a few people send in dream reports. Are you open to hearing one? Sure. All right. Um, we have one from Nat. And uh, the title of this is Bread in the Treehouse. And what Nat says is, I was at the home of my dearest friend. I was with her father around a dinner table covered in food. We were putting food on our dinner plates and I went straight for two big hunks of bread. I grabbed the butter and put so much butter on each piece. I ignore, ignored all the other food on the plate on the table. I took my plate outside and started to climb up to her tree house. There was no ladder, so I was basically scaling the side. And my friend and her sister were pulling me through a window, a small door. Once in the treehouse, my friend handed me a beautiful sandwich on crusty bread that I couldn't wait to sink my teeth into. I, I love this dream, Nat. I absolutely adore it. I'll, I'll say why in a moment. Now, we always ask when we're sharing dreams, I always suggest people, they do this in their own journal, note your first feelings around the dream. What does Nat say about feelings? Only sad, nostalgic, and hungry. I felt longing for my friend and being with her, fram her and her family. Yeah. And we also like to ask, you know, what do you recognize from this in, in, in ordinary life or in the rest of your life? What's a reality check? Do you recognize any of these elements? So we've been friends for years since birth, Nat shares. The tree house is where we used to play as children. But here in the dream, we are all our current adult ages. In ordinary life, we live with the entire country between us, and I don't see her much. I spent so much time with her and her family when we were young. I also felt a longing for butter and bread. It's not something I indulge in much as I keep to a fairly strict diet. I felt I definitely feel a strong longing for those that I love who are far away. The pandemic has amplified this. I long to be with friends and share a meal. I also do a ton of cooking, especially while sheltering in place, and feel that when someone shares food with me, they, uh, that they have made, it is in the ultimate act of love and nourishment. Oh, that's beautiful, Nat. I love that. Does Nat say anything about whether this could play out in the future in some way? She does. She says, I am sure to share meals with this friend again, but it's not likely to be in that treehouse. We I hadn't spoken so. in a month or so. Mm -hmm. She said yeah. she heard from her through texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does she say that whether there's anything in particular she'd like to know more about? She does. I want to know of other ways to fulfill all of this longing in my life and other ways to nourish myself. Nat, I love this on so many levels. I always wanted a treehouse as a boy. I never had one. So I'm already envious and longing for the treehouse. I think my favorite comfort food is bread and butter, good crusty bread and really yummy butter. Uh, so, and, and to be with a friend, a friend of my heart, a friend of my life up in the treehouse like we were as kids, 
and our present age, having this nourishing soul food is so comforting to me. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to tell the dream to my friend and I'm going to lay on all the juicy, sensual detail of the dream. And I'm going to suggest to my friend, why don't we make a date or a series of dates? Why don't we make it our game to visit each other, to rendezvous at the treehouse as we remember it, to meet there and to indulge in crusty bread and butter, just as I did in the dream. And we could prep for this by actually having some nice bread and butter on, on the way to trying to travel to our dream destination together. We're talking about a plan for shared interactive dreaming. We can do this. I, I'm, I'm always astonished that so few people seem to, seem to understand we truly can visit each other in the dream time. And isn't this a use? I'm getting shivers now. It's that exciting to me and maybe to you and maybe to others. Yeah, we're sheltering in place, many of us. I've hardly been anywhere for months. I normally spend half my time traveling all over the world. We can make a plan to meet those near and dear to us on agreed ground, make a rendezvous. I would. I wouldn't waste a moment before calling my friend, maybe with a piece of bread and butter in my hand. Forget about any dietary restrictions when it comes to soul food of this kind. Tell her the dream or tell her, her the dream again. Lay it on thick, thick as the butter. Lay on all the juicy detail of the dream and say, hey, why don't we imagine we can go there and hang out together? Whether you do it in a sleep dream or whether you do it in an exercise of the imagination, kind of lucid dreaming, the results might be wonderful and they would at the very least be a compensation, as the Jungians would say, for the difficulty and the absence of our regular social situation. There is no social distancing in dreams except what we choose to apply because we don't want to be rubbing up against everyone. But there's no other kind of social distancing involved in dreaming. So that would be my plan, Ned. And thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Robert. So we have time for a few more questions. And uh, before I take those, I want to give you a few details about adventures for healing in the dream time. So as you can tell, it's going to be an inspiring 13 weeks with Robert. This 13 week course takes place on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, starting June the 25th. Now, if for any reason you're unable to join us live, you won't miss the teachings. You'll receive audio and video replays, transcripts, and a handout uh, through our course homepage, any handouts that Robert shares. Also, I'd like to remind you that we offer a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks, in this case, until July the 9th, to make sure that you absolutely love it. And as an added option, this is actually a very big part of our courses with Robert. All participants are welcome and encouraged to connect over on a private Facebook community group to stay connected with one another, and also Robert is very, very active on that group. Everyone who re registers will receive these wonderful permanent bonuses. Uh, it's called the Adventures for Healing and the Dreamtime Bonus Collection. It involves evidence of dream healing from ancient Greece. This is a video teaching from Robert. Wings for the Journey. This is a wonderful audio recording of a drumming track that you can use for your journeys. Dreaming the Soul Back Home. This is a voice dialogue with Robert and Roger Kements, and also the Active Dreaming Toolkit. This is uh, Robert's toolkit that he provides for all of his courses. And when you register by midnight Pacific, June the 20th, you will receive this video bonus from Robert. It's an exciting one. Mark Twain, Master of Dreams and Synchronicity. This is a video teaching. Uh, and this is Mark Twain, beloved humorist and homespun American philosopher, was also a world-class dreamer and deep student of synchronicity. Lots to learn from that uh, video with Robert. All right, we're going to go over to a couple more questions here. Oh, Charlotte is asking, Robert, how do I facilitate a contact dream from a deceased loved one? Ah, well, <clears throat> probably uh, it starts by remembering that the contact may already have taken place. <laughs> I mean, the dreams of the departed are not strange, they're not weird, they're not unusual for three reasons. Um, the departed might still be with us, that can be good, bad or mixed. They come visiting. 
and in dreams we find ourselves traveling to their realms. You can certainly, so to get more practical about the situation, you can certainly lay a specific intention I'd like to dream with or dream of so and so, and you might initiate that by remembering a place that you shared or a place that that person loved, or the best thing would be to remember a dream that you've had. Okay, you haven't had a dream, what can you do? Well, you can make a journey. We can't attempt a journey to the departed in a Q&A session like this, but I lead journeys to the departed, which are very effective. I take people to a place in which they can imagine themselves, perhaps crossing to the other side of a body of water and meeting some kind of welcoming party and being guided to meet the departed on their own ground. You could start this in a very colloquial sort of corner of the family room kind of way by setting up a little altar, an informal altar in honor of that person. You put up maybe some food and drink that that person liked, maybe a photo, maybe a memento. And you start talking as if maybe that person can hear you. And if you have a sense of contact, you start writing down whatever comes to you. Perhaps all of this should be contained within the idea that if we have not had spontaneous contact with a departed person, which is most likely to take place in dreams, if we don't have a dream of that kind, maybe we should absolutely start by asking for guidance and blessing on this project from a higher source. If you are a person of faith, or if you have had an encounter with a spiritual guide and teacher you believe in, you could ask the angel, you could ask that spiritual being to watch over you and to help facilitate, if appropriate, the contact with the departed person that you would like to have. I repeat, watch your dreams, watch your dreams tonight. Don't tell yourself if you remember anything from your dreams that it's irrelevant, because one of the things that goes on in dreams is we often find ourselves wandering in other worlds, including the realities where the dead are alive. That goes on a lot more often than people who remember dreams recognize. Where were you exactly? Well, wait a minute. Maybe you were in a realm where the deceased are alive. So I'm going to revert to my basic thought about all of this. The easiest passport, the easiest doorway, the easiest portal to this kind of thing is to find the dream or let the dream find you. So you can go back to this dream cinema and you can seek a dream that will help to take you to the contact that you would like to have. Good luck with this because one of the things you're going to confirm is that healing, forgiveness, communication are always available to us across the apparent barrier of death and that discovery can change lives on both sides for the better it's something we need to understand very clearly in the times in which we're living thanks robert so rick is asking what is the difference between dreaming and imagination that's a hard thing to define, isn't it? Because certainly they play back and forth between each other. When we talk about dreaming, we're talking about what goes on in various states of consciousness. Sleep is, of course, uh, a, a place where we dream. And lots of people seem to think that dreams are only phenomena that happen during sleep. It's not the case. Dreaming is really about waking up. That's in the language of ancient Egypt, where the word we, for dream, reswet, as we transliterate it, means literally an awakening. We might be dreaming an in-between states of consciousness. We might be dreaming in meditation, a certain form of meditation. We might be dreaming in shamanic journey. We might be dreaming uh, when we pay attention to signs and symbols in the, in the world around us. So what is the difference between this and imagination? Well, I would say that imagination is uh, an, an active concept for me. Ag Jung gave us the phrase in the practice, active imagination. I'm saying something a little bit more. I'm saying that when we uh, use the imagination, we are choosing uh, to shape realities, choosing to bring together elements from different sources, including dreams and life memories, and things that come to us in other ways, and build with them. Uh, imagination is is a kind of uh, a kind of possibility to become architect of the reality you inhabit and the re reality that you can visit and you can see. So if I'm slithering a little bit about making uh, absolutely clear distinctions, I must admit that I don't think that I can. They shade into each other. Dreaming and imagination are close allies. Uh, you've heard me say almost as synonyms, you can go into the dream time or you can go into the imaginal realm, the realm of true imagination. I think I probably want to take refuge in the idea that imagination, as I understand it and teach and practice it, is a very conscious process. 
of using the resources of the inner mind to bring into form that we can perceive and work with things that sometimes are beyond form or beyond or beyond uh, the level of surf of the surface mind, the level of consciousness. So imagination can be finding and using the materials to construct something in a world that is no less real than the physical and from which we can project and manifest things on the physical plane. Something like that. Thank you for addressing that. So a little bit of logistics here. Can you talk a bit about your suggested way to best record or write down a dream? Once awake and during the process of remembering, the ego seems to slip in and change the narrative. Well, the ego is going to slip in at some point, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because the ego might also on this occasion be the story maker who's trying to give a beginning, a middle and an end to an adventure that isn't at first recollected that way. And that might end in sort of distorting or losing some of the plenitude of the dream. But nonetheless, we like our stories. We like something we can get a handle on. So I wouldn't toss out the idea that the ego has no role to play here. What I like to do in terms of maintaining an honoring the basic meat, the basic juice, the basic life of the dream, is to jot something down as soon as possible. Typically, I do that these days by typing something into my phone in bed before I even get out of bed, before I go to the bathroom. It might just be a phrase. Uh, the early hours of this morning, for example, the phrase was, the phrase was, uh, wings of, uh, 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 excuse me, the phrase was whispers of angels, whispers of angels. See, it, it trembled even now, even though I wrote it down, whispers of angels. Uh, so let me, to answer it, let me give my, you my own practice this morning. So I wake at, you know, four o'clock in the morning, as I often do, before going to the bathroom, I'm thinking about a scene, which I'm sitting at the front of a huge auditorium knee, next to somebody who looks like uh, the guitarist from, uh, from the Rolling Stones at his present age, Ronnie Wood, I think is his name. We're sitting up there together. The auditorium is mostly empty, but fine. We're going to, our performance is going to be broadcast all over the world, millions. And we have a song we're going to sing, and I've written some of it. And I think he's done some of the music, and it's called, it's called Here We Go Again. It's called Whispers of Angels. So I'm lying in bed. I write down Whispers of Angels. When I get up a little bit later, I go to check online that the name of the Rolling Stone is indeed Ronnie Wood. And I write down the rest of the details. And then I write down the earlier dreams, some earlier dreams from the sequence, which are coming back to me, but didn't have the absolute importance and urgency and excitement of, of whispers of dreams with the Rolling Stone. So uh, I will get something down if I'm not going to do it on my phone. I'll get it, do it on a bedside pad, but I can't read my own writing. I don't particularly want to talk as soon as I've woken up in the night, so I'm not interested in voice recorders, but some people, for some people, they, they work absolutely fine. So that might work for you. Uh, if I'm traveling, which I'm not doing very much these days, I will write my dream report, the first version of it, in a rather beautiful travel diary. I have many of them. I might do a sketch. Since I'm at home, I tend to go straight to the computer after making my initial notes and type up a full report. And then it goes in my digital database. And this becomes very interesting. As I keep my journal on a digital word database, I have a search engine. I can I can bring up, you know, Rolling Stone, Whispers of Angels, Black Dog or anything else. And any report that I have ever written in all of my archive will jump up. I have a running chronological index because I title things and have a chronological index and that's available to me too and because i can't read my own handwriting it is invaluable to have this stuff typed up in a digital database so i'm talking now about one of the most essential practices for life not just for dreaming but for life for self-reflection self-awareness for waking up to the patterns of your life for being able to step out of the circles of dull repetition into a spiral of personal growth and evolution and this resource this tool is your journal. I didn't say your dream journal. My journal always starts every day with a dream report if I have one, but it contains miniature essays, reflections, notes on synchronicities, quotes, all sorts of stuff goes into it. The journal is the essential tool for self-awareness. 
in in a conscious life, in a life that is being lived consciously. It's absolutely unavoidable for a writer. You want to be a writer, keep a journal. It's absolutely unavoidable for the practice of dreaming. It's absolutely unavoidable, unavoidable for the practice of real magic, real shamanism. It's your magical diary. It becomes your encyclopedia of symbols. It becomes your way of observing, you know, recurring patterns in your life and in your dreams. It becomes a place where you dialogue with yourself and it must, must, must be your secret book. No one gets to look in this unless you invite them to see a certain entry. And there is a point, of course, in sharing some of our reports and stories. And we learn in my courses how to do that in a generous, fast, fun way by which we can give each other helpful feedback, guide each other towards actions to embody the healing and creative energy of a dream or something like a dream and do it all in a few minutes. That is wonderful, Robert. Thank you so much. Um, so I just have one more quick question for you. It's from Jenny. Is daydreaming just as powerful as nighttime dreaming? If one daydreams a particularly desirable scenario, but doesn't have the same dream at night, is that same scenario less likely to manifest? Very interesting two-part question. And I think you answered the first half in, in my terms. Uh, daydreaming might be just as powerful as night dreaming if you're really into it, if you're there with all of your senses. If it comes alive, you vivid. You can taste it, touch it, smell it. And you can bring something from it, at least in terms of your energy. I mean, there's idle daydreaming, idle fancy. And then there is, let us say, directed daydreaming, which or directed reverie, which might become a, a kind of, you know, a kind of yoga of consciousness even. I mean, I like to do this kind of thing or what I jokingly call horizontal meditation. I'm lying on bed. I'm not awake. I'm not asleep. I'm just practicing this kind of daydreaming, if you want to call it that, or night dreaming. So if you're deep into it, if you can taste it, touch it, feel it, etc it has energetic consequences for you if it's not reflected to your in your dreams in any way that might be a sort of bit of a caveat because one of the great things about spontaneous sleep dreams is they have a certain objectivity i mean by that we can sort of trust that they are for real that might say and sound odd to some people we can trust that we're not simply making it up in the limited sense our night dreams tend to serve up to us what is timely spontaneous authentic and true for us and what we need to see at the time of the dream and might like it or not be ready to see and need to see so there is an objectivity a sense of objectivity of an objective source that is lacking sometimes in daydreaming and fantasy and making it up uh, nonetheless here well here's a play between sleep between dream and imagination there's a clear contrast between sleep dreams in that sense and the products of the imagination in waking life that's a clear distinction which I should add to what I said earlier. But still, I mean, I would certainly give great applause and great encouragement to any effort to grow a desirable scene which you can inhabit either for the moment, for entertainment and regeneration in the moment, or something that might manifest in your life in the kind of juicy, full-blooded uh, daydreaming that might be possible. Go for it. Thanks so much, Robert. So this has just been a fabulous hour. It went by so quickly. I want to thank everyone for being with us today and for all your questions. Adventures for Healing in the Dreamtime begins Thursday, June the 25th. Again, I urge you to visit dreamtraditions.com. You will learn so much about this course, and there's also a link to register. And for those of you that know you want in, you register by midnight June the 20th, midnight Pacific, June the 20th, and you'll receive a really special bonus called Mark. Mark Twain, Master of Dreams and Synchronicity. Robert, passing it over to you for final words, anything you're called to share. Well, we have to close with the invocation of the gatekeeper, which I gave earlier. And this is for your life, not just for your dreams. As you go forward on your roads of soul, may your doors and gates and paths be open. And may the doors and gates and paths of any who wish to do you or those you love any harm be closed. May it be so. Let me just say it's very important to have some words of this kind that you believe in that work for you at any time, particularly in a time when so many of us feel in need of safety and in need of calling on higher sources of guidance and protection. Those are words that have worked for me for decades. If they work for you, please feel free to use them. Let me give you a dreamer's wish. May your best dreams come true and may you remember them. That was wonderful, Robert. Thank you so much for being here today. Okay, thank you all.
Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us on behalf of all of us here at the Shift Network. We wish you well, and we look forward to having you on this course or on one in the future. Be well. <laughs>